Hi, this is Misha, and today we're revisiting a gun that several of you have uh, asked us to kind of pull back up again. And we've had uh, we had an old video looking at it specifically, and it's appeared in a number of our more recent videos as an example piece. This is my Russian Izmash SGL 31, and this is the 3194 variant with the side folding stock. This is the Arsenal import. This is the later Fime import. Not that there's really much of a difference. And while we were doing this, I thought we would go ahead and pull out its equivalent in the Molot line. Now this video is not on this here. This is the Russian Molot Vepper FM. 7421. This is also a side folding stock. Sometimes it can be stiff when new, so let me see. Yeah, it's not too bad. And it's the equivalent gun in the, in the Molot line. Now we have a lot of videos looking at Molots because of the recent sanctions against them, so we're not going to get too much in the history of this one. I just brought it out as a comparison with the Sega, with the SGL here. Both of these are in 5.45 by 39 M74, which is the Soviet take on a small diameter, high velocity, intermediate round. And the SGL3194 is really the best semi-auto, if not the only, true semi-auto version of a Russian AK-74M to come into the USA. So, people like I said want me to talk about this. <laughs> In our AK-74 video we really talk about what the AK-74M, the select fire version, is. So, for the history of the military version of this gun, please check that video out. I don't think I should probably go into that here today. Going over the feature set of the SGL31, we have a 14, excuse me, a 24 millimeter thread on the muzzle. This is actually part of the front sight base, not the barrel itself. We have a removable AK74 flash hide, or excuse me, muzzle brake. Sorry guys, it's been a long day. We have a bayonet lug here, cleaning rod, another accessory lug here, 90 degree gas block, standard gas system with polymer hand guards, standard weight 16 and a quarter inch barrel. We have a proper AK-74M rear sight out to a thousand meters. We have the smooth top cover, which is a little bit heavier dutier. Typical AK selector, which acts as a dust cover when up. Flipping it over, we have the modern scope rail version. We have this folding stock as you saw. The button to fold it is here. Folds over. Locks into a latch on the side here. To release it, there's this button here. Very easy to do. There is a storage compartment in the stock for a cleaning kit. And this has an original Russian paint over phosphating type finish. Very military grade finish. Comparing that to the Vepper, while the SGL is based on the AK-74M, the Vepper is based on the RPK M or RPK 74M if in, the, in this caliber because Molot does not produce the assault rifle AK, it produces the light machine gun RPK. To that end, we have 14 millimeter threads directly on the barrel. These just come with a muzzle nut, but since 14mm thread is standard for AKs, any 
basic AK device will fit. Plunger in the front sight base. This front sight base is unique to the Vepr. That's because we have an RPK barrel, which is 16 and a half inches long, and it is heavy profile, especially under the handguards, but it tapers and gets a little thinner right here. Then, instead of having 23 inches as on the machine gun, it's chopped down to 16 and a half. So they had to make a special front sight base to fit on it. The gas block is also a little bit different because it does not have the loop for the cleaning rod. We have standard RPK handguards squared off with a heat shield, standard length gas system. We have an RPK rear sight, which is windage and elevation adjustable as opposed to just elevation on the Sega on the SGL. We have a very similar top cover. Both of these have heavy duty top covers that are smooth. However, the SGL has a 1.0 mil stamped receiver with a standard front trunnion. The Vepr has a 1.5 millimeter stamped receiver with a bulged or reinforced front trunnion. This was done partially to give added strength and also to accommodate the larger diameter barrel. The bolt group and all that is basically the same. Flipping it over, we also have a scope rail, modern style. We have a stock that also folds to the left, although the mechanism is different. The release is here. This is the RPK style. We also have a flippable cheek piece for use with optics. It kind of locks down in this position when not in use. Come on. There we go. This is made of metal. This is polymer overlaid with the rubber butt plate back here. And so on. So you see the Vepr is based on the RPK and the Sega is based on the AK-74. So two different critters, and we have videos on both of these military select fire guns. So for their histories, check those out. I just wanted to bring that out as a comparison to show you how these are similar and different. The Sega is going to be a lighter gun. The Vepr may be a little more heavy duty. These both have chrome line barrels. They both have hammer forge barrels. So the barrel is equally good. This one's just lighter. So that's pretty much the comparison of those two. Now comparing this Sega SGL31 to the original, let's get into a little bit of the history of uh, Izhmash, which was once known as Izhesk until the fall of the Soviet Union, and what's happened. So after the Soviet Union fell, Izhmash came into being as a modern company that needed to make profit in Russia, in the Russian Federation. It was still supplying and still today supplies rifles to the Russian military, but it got more into the commercial market beginning around 94. It started a civilian sporting line of guns known as collectively the Sega. The Sega has been made in a myriad of calibers, also as shotguns in addition to being rifles. And there are many, many, many styles. You will see some that are basically military. Some that have fixed stocks, some that have folding solid body like this. Some that have a, a skeletonized folder. You'll see this standard handguard. You'll also see a sporter handguard, which is longer with an exposed uh, gas tube. And it uses a different handguard retainer. All kinds of variations. The one we're most familiar with when you think of Sega in the U.S. is the one with the, uh, the Sporter, the Monte Carlo style stock. These started to be imported into the USA in the very late 90s, early 2000s. I know the first one I saw in person was probably around 2001, 2002. They are very inexpensive. The core gun was in a Kalashnikov. And I hope to have one for this video, but I, I don't have one myself, and I asked a couple of friends to borrow theirs, and it just, it just didn't happen on time. So, sorry for that. We'll try to throw up some pictures, if you could. But it'll have this, the trigger group is moved to the rear, to about right here, to allow for the sporter stock. The rear trunnion and tangs are different. 
as I said, it'll have a sporter handguard. The sights can range anywhere from adjustable leaf out to 300 meters to some guns having fixed notches and so on and so forth. They have the basic qualities of an Ishmash gun. They're equally well built with a cold hammer forged chrome line barrel and barrel lengths can be anywhere from 16 inches up to 20, 21, 23, and so on. I think there's even some 25 inches. So barrels can be a, a wide range. And this is what, these were really the first Russian-built AK-type guns we saw in the USA. And they were pretty remarkable for their day. Unfortunately, they were heavily sporterized to be not just legal for U.S. import, but legal for Russian export. Because in 1994... The Russian Federation agreed in a bilateral agreement with the United States to not export military style guns over here. Now there was a, a list of exemptions including those in Nagants, but they for, forgot to put some guns on that such as the SVT-40, this is why these stopped coming in in 94, and obviously AK type guns were not, were not kosher. So they got around that rule in Russia by sending over very sporter type guns, beginning as I said in the late 90s. These could theoretically be converted, but it required quite a bit of work because the trigger group was in the rear, you had a different rear tang you would have to modify to take a standard stock, the front was different, so on and so forth. Also back then, AK building wasn't near as popular as it is today and has been for the last 10 years. So there weren't a lot of companies making conversion parts. So fast forward, that's what we have. After the sunset of the assault weapons ban in September of 2004, people were more interested in AK style guns because they could put evil features back on them. So you started to see more Sega conversions. Well, in 2008, Arsenal Incorporated of Las Vegas, who had been importing the Bulgarian line started to import Russian Segas, and they soon announced what was called the SGL-10. Now the SGL-10 was an interesting critter that was very short-lived. It had the Monte Carlo sporter stock, and with the trigger group still on the rear, but it had a converted front end. It had took standard handguards, and it could have a 74 muzzle brake, even some removable. So the front end was getting more converted. Also, it was converted to take standard magazines. The Segas always came in with a double stack magazine well. However, it had been modified by lacking a bullet guide and also having the mag catch modified to not feed from standard 30 round or 40 round Kalashnikov mags. So, they modified the mag well back, they added some US parts for 922R and announced the Sega 10. It was in 762 by 39 which is obviously the most popular caliber. In late 2008, around December, they released the SGL-20. Now the 20 was a full conversion gun. It was very similar to this one here, except it was still in 762 by 39 and it had a fixed buttstock. Now it took standard buttstocks, it had a standard pistol grip. One thing to note about this SGL series from this point onward, these were not stock normal Segas brought over and converted by Arsenal. They were brought over a little differently. For one, and most importantly to me, the trigger group was never in the rear. So they never had rivet holes they had to fill in back here. It was always in the front. There was no reason to have it in the rear aside from that was just happened to be the sporter model that was being sold to the Russian civilian public so they sold it over here because it was easy and convenient and Americans would buy it. But they started to import these with more thumbhole Dragonov SVD type stocks so the trigger group was in the front. No holes. Now if you own one of these you know under the pistol grip here there's a cutout for a trigger and this has confused a lot of people. What they did because these were semi-auto receivers with no full auto capability, they made them both ways. The, whether the trigger group was here or in the back, they used the same receiver blank. So they would have a, a trigger cut out in either area and then they would just build it up accordingly at the factory. So while there will be a second trigger cut out on the underside 
of the receiver, which is covered up by your pistol grip here, there aren't filled in rivets because the trigger group came in in the front. Thumb hole stock, so on. The front end came in initially with a few different ways. The first ones that Arsenal would convert, as I said, had fixed stocks. They would come with a muzzle nut and they would not have an accessory lug here. This would still be ground off. They also would be fitting them originally with Bulgarian front side towers, not Russian. The difference is the difference between an AK-74 front sight tower and an AK-74M front sight tower, with the biggest difference being the long collar on the M versus the short collar on the 74. So that was the SGL-2020, which came in in late 2008. It was sold with black furniture, plum furniture, green furniture, so on. It was soon replaced, though, by the SGL-21, which had only two differences between it and the SGL-20. First, they started using authentic Russian front sight bases, which I thought was a great idea. Second, they would start using a gas block with the accessory lug, which really doesn't do anything, but it's a cosmetic thing. These guns were pretty pricey when they first came out at around 900 to 1,000, so people were buying them wanted a true Russian gun. In 2009, they finally released a version in 545 by 39. It was known as the SGL 31. The fixed stock version had a few different designations from 47, 31, 47 up to 31, 61, and led eventually 31, 68, and so on. So they would eventually do a 545 version, and they would even do a version in 410, basically using the Sega 410 as a base. It was called the SGL 41. All of these came out in 2009. Also in 2009 was what was called the AK Stimulus Plan. After the election in 08, there was a big buying panic in America for evil type guns. But by the end of 2009, this was slowing down and sales were kind of slumping. So Arsenal announced the AK Stimulus Plan where they cut the prices on these. The SGL 21s went down to $4.99 retail with the SGL 41s going down to about $4.50, maybe it was $4.70, but a little bit cheaper. Now the SGL 31s, because they had just been released, never were on sale that much. They were still hanging in about $800, maybe $700 on a good day. So the, the 31s were always higher. Alright, so there we're getting through history. Hey, you, got, you guys asked for it. <laughs> the next year, the folding stock versions came out. Now this is a true AK-74M style folding stock, solid body, Russian made stock. The SGL-94, you see here, with the solid body. There was also the SGL-3184, which had the steel triangular stock. And it's worth pointing out that since these are the modern styles, they do use the newer AK-74M 5.5 millimeter pin as opposed to the older 4.5 millimeter pin, pivot pin. One other thing to point out, because these were civilian product lines, there is a small vertical slot cut into the stock and the pin. It does nothing here in the USA, but in Russia that slot would have been there to put in a block. In Russia, a gun this short would not be legal for civilian sale with the stock folded because over there they have rules about firing length so what they do to get around it they connect the stock to the safety so when your safety's on you can fold the stock when the safety's off you cannot fold the stock I actually have one of those devices somewhere out there. I'll, I'll try to show you guys one day. It's, it's just a small piece of metal that cams back and forth that's connected to the safety. But it's, I guess, interesting. It doesn't change anything. The cutout will be in the trunnion, the stock, and the pivot pin, but it doesn't hurt anything. Some guys like to change this out. 
Honestly, if these stocks were cheaper, I probably would too, just because. But since this is an authentic stock that's just been modified for the Russian civilian market, I'm not going to pay over $100 just to not have a little cutout you can't even see. That's personal choice. So, the side folding version in 545 came out in 2010. It would eventually be joined by the SGL 2194 and 2184, which was the side folding versions in 76239. However, they never really made many of these. They, they were pretty limited production. Also, another limited production version, instead of having the front sight and the gas block, would have a combination front sight gas block here with the barrel sticking out. It was analogous to the Arsenal SLR 106-107CR, and it even used a Bulgarian base and a Bulgarian 500 meter rear sight, but that was a version. Oddly, it had a fixed stock, except for a few dozen folders that they made, but most of that version, and I'm trying to remember its name, guys, it escapes me at the moment. I apologize. I think it was called the SGL-22 and the SGL-32, but don't hold me to that. I believe that was the designation. So that gets us up until when five, FIME takes over. In 2013, Arsenal wanted to split its Bulgarian imports off from its Russian imports, so FIME Group took over importing the Russian guns. So these guns would come in with FIME markings for the last year and a half or so of importation. They would ship with 30 round mags, Similar to this, so this is a Russian, they would usually ship with, um, with Bulgarian. And the reason they actually did that, when Izhmash sent over that shipment of guns, they didn't include the 10 round mags that they had been originally shipping with the guns. So they received no mags with the guns. So this is why FIME started including 30 round Bulgarian mags with their guns, because they didn't have any other 545 caliber magazines. The designations would change to SGL 3195 and SGL 3185 to denote the magazine. That's for the folders. The fixed stocks would be SGL 68. Excuse me, SGL 3168. Again, you asked for it. So that was pretty much the last versions that came in. There were the Sega 12 shotguns and the SGL 12 shotguns, which were militarized versions, but those are for a different video. In June of 2014, Izhesk, Izhmash guns, were sanctioned under the Kalashnikov concern due to the uh, war in Ukraine and continuing uh, diplomatic disagreements between Russia and the USA. So these guns have not been imported for three years. The Sega, the SGL, has always really impressed me because of being Russian. It's not just a converted Sega. As I said, the trigger group came in in the correct position. Also, the markings were more military style. And some people say these have a little better fit and finish, a little better quality control. Arsenal always claimed that these were put together at the uh, Legion division in Izhmash, which was basically their custom shop, kind of like Colt Custom Shop or Smith & Wesson. So, supposedly these came out of a slightly more exclusive branch of Izhmash. There are a few complaints. Some people complained about the finish. It's military grade finish. It does what it does. The biggest one I hear is that on these folders, we don't have a reinforcing plate above the trigger, I mean behind the trigger above the pistol grip. Some people go to the trouble of even taking the receiver apart and riveting one in place. You can do that. I'm just going to leave this one as factory because it's still a semi-automatic gun. No matter what you do, it's not going to be an AK-74M. It's still a semi-automatic Sega type gun, SGL type gun. There's also complaints that sometimes when they were installing these rear trunnions, that they dimpled the receiver a bit. You can see a little bit of a ring around this rivet here on mine. Really not one up here. Really not much of one on the other side. But some people complained about that. 
it doesn't uh, doesn't really bother me. It's about as good a job as anyone's going to do. These rear trunnions are pretty uh, challenging to install because of the angle, the receiver, and all that. Certainly no um, uh, functional difference. It's completely cosmetic, and the receiver is not cracked or anything. It's just they dimpled it in when they put the um, rivet in a bit. Some have said that the Fime guns are a little more dimpled than the Arsenal's. I don't know. I've had the Fime guns in the store, but I never paid close attention, and I never owned one personally. These guns have been pretty collectible. I still shoot mine. Why not? I bought it as a shooter and bought it several years. My first one I bought when these came out in 2010. And that one I ended up giving to a friend and then picked up a second one. I think it was 2011. This one might be a 12, but either way, same thing. The guns were the same, so... I let him have that one and just grabbed that other one for myself. But I really like it for its Russian connection. It is pretty much all Russian components. It's made in the Russian military factory. It's made just like a military AK-74M with a few minor exceptions, which really wouldn't matter to anyone but the biggest AK purist. I mean, I am an AK purist, I guess you could say. Certainly an AK collector and everything. So little things like the missing reinforcing plate bug me a smidge, but not enough to do much about. So that is the SGL-31. It's certainly one of my favorite Kalashnikov guns. I mean, there's nothing super special about it, I suppose. I mean, the, this, the action is quite smooth, but not the smoothest. The trigger is... Actually, I replaced the trigger it came with, which was the Arsenal cast trigger. I put one of the newer Arsenal triggers that came out this year in it, so the trigger is better. The barrel is obviously a good quality barrel. The main thing is, this is a Russian AK. And for a time, these were very affordable. Again, you could get the basic model for $500, or the 545 for about $700, or even the side folders when they first came out were $1,000. Which, by modern standards, does not seem that much. Back then, people thought it was. But they were priced reasonably well. They were the same price, or a little cheaper than the Bulgarian guns. They were obviously more expensive than the Romanian Wassers, but it was an alternative for someone wanting an authentic Russian gun. And I'm very happy I did pick one of these up years ago because it's been a great gun. Obviously, they're, they're completely reliable. And uh, it's very unique because you just don't see many AK-74M type guns. They just, they just don't exist because Russia is the only nation to ever make the AK-74M, thus the parts for it. And with sanctions going on, you get the idea. It's really hard to clone one at least economically so, because of needing all the specialized parts. We have an older video comparing this to an AKS-74, the SGL, excuse me, the SLR-104FR. We'll probably revisit that because I've also been asked to put it up against the Arsenal. You don't think about it, just looking at them separately, but when you put them side by side, you really see how all the small parts are different. The way the sight base is cut, the gas block, the scope rail, the dust cover. When you take all these small nitpicky differences as a whole, when you realize there's probably 40 differences that are just visible from the outside, it does start to, to add up. So that's why this is a pretty unique gun. It's one of my favorites, one I enjoy shooting, and uh, one that will probably always make, you know, top of my list. Plus I just like that it's uh, Russian. And like I said, I just brought the Vepper out. Unfortunately, these guys just got banned. For a long time, these were a great alternative. They're not really an RPK because of the short barrel, but they are still a high-quality Russian-built gun. And after these critters got sanctioned in 14, Fime started working on bringing these guys in. Unfortunately, they only brought them in for about a year before they got sanctioned too. So, tough luck, I guess. But it's also a great alternative. You can still find these available, especially in 545. So if you do want a Russian gun and can't find a Sega, a Vepper is still a really good option. It's a little heavier, but also quite a bit more durable, I'm sure. Not that you ever really hear of AKs failing in general. People always point that out about five point, excuse me, uh, 1.5 millimeter receivers. Oh, they're stronger, you know. 
well, true, but how often have you heard of a 1.0 millimeter receiver failing, especially a quality good one that's properly heat treated? These things are just built to last. Well, appreciate you tuning in. Like I said, this is kind of a viewer request video, so I just want to go over the history and the Sega, and we'll do a comparison sometime against one of the SLR 104s, I'm sure. If you have any questions or comments, please post them below. You know, the usual yada yada by now. If you like the video, we'd really appreciate it if you click that. If you haven't already subscribed and could, we'd really appreciate that too. And please tune in again next time for more, hopefully, interesting videos. This is Misha, and we'll catch you then.